seems very easy to do, right? Nobody told me you have to have an engineering degree to put the thing together. So I'm working on it, and uh, something doesn't seem right. I'm trying to look at the manual, look at the picture on the box, and then look at what I got going on. I'm like, it's not adding up here. Something's off. And my wife came in. She was resting. She came in, and she said, is that top piece, is that supposed to be able to spin around so the baby can play with it, the crossbar? And, uh, <laughs> I said, sort of re what I was doing. I said, I don't know. And so I got to the other side, and I put it up, and I'm like, there's a hinge in here for that thing over there. And there was some Anyways, long story short, I put the thing backwards. And I had to undo everything that I had done. But what really, really freaked me out, maybe because I'm ghetto, but I was okay with it. The baby's going to sleep in it. It's not going to fall through or collapse. It just looks a little awkward. And I started thinking, like, because my wife, and she knows it, like, right away, like, mom instinct. She's like, you need to put my baby in that ghetto. You know? And, and I'm like, what is the, like, I'm like, it's not that bad. And she's like, oh, that's horrible. That's, thanks, honey. And so we undid it all and got to put it together the right way. Maybe we'll be sleeping in a good crib now. So that's good. But I started looking at it and I started wondering, I wonder how many Christians think their life looks good. But somebody on the outside can walk up to him and be like, dude, really? Your crossbar is like that. And it kind of started like pain in me, actually. It kind of started bothering me when I started. Because it's tricky. It really is. We can deceive ourselves and we can trick ourselves a lot. And we can make ourselves think that we're doing better than what we are. Amen? And so I started thinking about after you accept Christ. Like, because I'm going to assume that everybody, assume that everybody in here loves Jesus Christ, has accepted Him as the Lord and Savior, and we've all made decisions to follow Him. And if not, you'll have an opportunity each time that we do a service to, do, to make that decision or to recommit your life. But I started thinking about what really changes in our life. And I look at this, this Psalm 139, 23 and 24. It says, uh, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me. Lead me in the everlasting way. And I started kind of meditating on that. I started thinking, we all got garbage. Let's be honest. I remember when I was first going to church, and I remember being around everybody, and everybody looked like they had it all together. And I remember thinking, like, because I'm wrestling with this. For, for, this is after I accepted Christ, by the way. I accepted Christ. I loved Him. I loved God. I loved going to church. I loved worshiping God. I loved it. But I had this hidden lust problem that I couldn't contend. And it went on four or five years, and I remember looking around me, and I remember thinking... I'm fake. Everybody else like loves Jesus. They got it together. And then I started noticing a pattern. Everybody's messed up. And I remember feeling so awkward and so guilty in services. And I remember thinking to myself, I missed the ball. Like someone was like, Did I just accept Christ and automatically like I'm good, right? Like he just changes me like overnight, instantaneous, and I'm just like good. And I started thinking, there's got to be something more. There, there has to be more. I need to be doing more. Something's got to change in my life. And so I stumbled upon this, this quote from D.A. Carson. It says, People do not drift toward holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate toward godliness, prayer, obedience to Scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. We drift toward compromise and call it tolerance. We drift toward disobedience and call it freedom. We drift toward superstition and call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slouch toward prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we have escaped legalism. We slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves we have been liberated. Let's be honest. As human beings, we're far from God. We make mistakes. We, we, everybody in here, you can point at any person in here, and you can, if you evaluate their life and you put them under the microscope, everybody's got something in them that needs to go, that needs to change, right? And then I love this because the theme today, we're talking about a mistaken identity from Ephesians 4, 17 to 32, if you take notes. But I love it because we couldn't pick a better writer and a better church here. Okay? A little bit about the author here. The author is Paul, who had the, the actual the name change, right? In scripture, he was Saul, then he was Paul, and he had that new identity, that new conversion where he came to Christ and he was really, really messed up before killing people on the run. Bad person, he changes, re, you know, recovers his life in Christ, and then now he writes this book to a very, very, by the way, mature church. 
Ephesians is a very mature book. And so when we see reminders in Ephesians, it allows us to know that we're never like too good for God to do work in our lives. Amen. God's always wanting to refine our character and our conduct every day, all the time. And so I'm going to preach today, and I'm going to like probably break a holy rule, and I'm going to preach from the message translation. Like if you're like really holy in here, you're mad because you're saying that. Okay, but I'm going to do it anyways. All right. So let's pray and let's get to the message. Lord, we just thank you for an opportunity to worship you today. Father, I pray that uh, we would hear Paul's words, we would actually absorb them, we would pay careful attention to the, the description of what a Christian life is. And that, God, we wouldn't rely on the rules, but we would rely on a relationship with you, Jesus, to change us. We thank you so much for going to a cross, for dying uh, perfect and sinless and spotless, so that we could be made right with God. We love you, Lord. We thank you for a time to gather and worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so I'm just going to read it, and then we're going to kind of cut into it, okay? Ephesians 4, 17 through 32, message translation. And so I insist, and God backs me up on this, that there be no going along with the crowd, the empty-headed, mindless crowd. They've refused for so long to deal with God that they've lost touch not only with God, but with reality itself. They can't think straight anymore. Feeling no pain, they let themselves go in sexual obsession, addicted to every sort of perversion. But that's no lie for you. You learn Christ. My assumption is that you have paid careful attention to him, been well instructed in the truth precisely as we have it in Jesus. Since then, we do not have the excuse of ignorance. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it. And then take an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your character and conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. What this adds up to is this. No more lies. No more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other after all. When you lie to others, you end up lying to yourself. Go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry. But don't use your anger as a fuel for revenge. And don't stay angry. Don't go to bed angry. Don't give the devil the kind, that kind of foothold in your life. Did you used to make in, ends meet by stealing? Well, no more. Get an honest job so that you can help others who can't work. Watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps each word of gift. Don't grieve God. Don't break His heart. His Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for Himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. Make a clean break with all cutting, backbiting, profane talk. Be gentle with one another, sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly as, and thoroughly as, as God and Christ forgave you. So that's what we have. We have Paul saying basically, here's an old life, here's a new life. The, the old way of life, he's, he's got three characteristics that basically sum up on the screen here. Three, three basic characteristics on our own, here's our old life. Unpractical, corrupt thought. He says, uh, in, in scripture here, he says that these people have, have they feel no pain no more. They, they went on long enough in their own way that they actually feel no remorse. They've lost the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit. By the way, the Holy Spirit is the thing that whispers that conviction in your ear, like you shouldn't do this, don't do that. And all of a sudden, if you go along so far in that, then all of a sudden it's just going to cut itself off, right? You're going to have it hardened so far, you're not going to feel those things anymore. So he's saying there's like, there's going to be, the, these people are, the old life, they're corrupt. They have these thoughts that amount to nothing. And then he says, ignorance of God and hardness of heart. Second characteristic of the old life. You didn't know about God. You didn't know God because you weren't brought to God. Because for a long time, many of us without God, we do our own thing. We do what we want to do. As a follower of Christ, Paul says here, basically, when you turn to God, you can't do that anymore. There, there's new rules. There's new ways to walk. There's a new way to live. And, and that thing has got to go. And then the last characteristic, chase more and more. A big problem with, with our society today is the fact that they chase more and more, is it not? They always want the bigger, the better, and then if you're not happy, go out and run up some credit card debt, and then three years, you're like one bankrupt, right? Because you want to be happy, and God's got a life for all of us that makes us happy. It's the Christian life. He's got, a, he's got our life planned out for us. Jeremiah 29, it says he's got a plan for a future for all of us. And then when we seek his face with our whole heart, right, then we'll find him, and then he'll reveal that plan to each one of us specifically. 
And, and before this, before Paul's at, in, in this passage, he's actually just got done talking about how he wants us all to be brought up in spiritual maturity and unity, right? That's kind of the linking theme in the book of Ephesians, that he wants everybody in Christ to be united. But you can't be united with one another if you haven't found Christ, because without Christ, you're not united. You're not reconciled to God without Jesus Christ on that day when we go to heaven. We're, our hope that we're banking on, right, is that Christ died for our sins. We've accepted that, and now we get to enter into the heaven. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and life, and nobody comes to the Father except for through me. And it's Jesus speaking, right? So you have this old way of life. And basically, he says, there's an old life and there's a new life, and he gives all these rules, right? These, these seven things. And basically, to sum up, he says, stop lying. No, no more lying. Look, tell everybody the truth. If you must be angry, don't sin in the process. Well, when does anger become sin? Right? He, he says, don't go to bed angry. Well, well, it becomes a sin when you start internalizing. And when you start reflecting on it, and you start like thinking bad thoughts, and you start meditating on bitterness, and it kind of soaks in your heart. Because God wants you to have a sensitive heart. God wants you to have a, a clear conscience and let, let his word flow into it. He doesn't want you to be angry. Many people think of God, they think God's angry at you. Guess what? Far from God being angry at you, He wants you to repent and be right with Him because He loves you more than what you'll ever know. Amen? The third thing He says, He says, quit being a taker and start being a giver, basically. He, he says, you used to steal to make ends meet. Well, guess what? Everybody in here, guess what? Here's the theme of church. We come together, we give, we do an offering every week because we want to see God's work continued on, right? One of the things right now that we're in the middle of, middle of right now is we're in the middle of our building collection. All right, we're thirteen thousand seven hundred seventy-one dollars and seventy-six cents into it. We've got to raise forty thousand dollars. How's that going to happen? We're going to pray. And we're going to give because that's what Christians do. Amen. We are givers. We're not takers. We help people out when we see a person in need. Hopefully, the Christian says, "What can I do for you? You're broken. You're lost. Cool. I was too. I was a mess without Christ. We got that in common. Let's talk." The fourth thing: watch your mouth. That one's tough. Anybody else struggle with that one? Yeah. Uh, James, when James talks about it, he calls it a fiery member, right? He says that's the thing that nobody can conquer. It's the thing that gets us all in trouble. How many people in here sometimes have that problem where they talk before they think? All of us, probably a lot of us, yeah. And, and before you know it, you put your foot in your mouth, right? And I told you guys about my, my big one of the year when I walked up to my wife. I thought I was giving her a compliment. And I said, honey, since you've been pregnant, your butt's really developed. Thought it was a compliment. She didn't think so. We didn't talk for a few hours. <laughs> Awkward. Don't do that, right? Fifth one, don't hurt God by your words and your actions. I love that prayer in Psalm. He says, show me what I'm doing wrong. If I'm doing something wrong, God, show me. I don't want to be right with you. He's got an earnest plea to a God that sees everything. Does everybody know no creature is hidden in God's sight? But I love this thought. You want to talk about a mistaken identity. You remember when Adam and Eve fell in the garden? And God comes to him and he says, where are you? And then Adam starts trying to like hide himself from God. Can we be honest? The creator sees us all. He sees you right where you're at, when you're doing what you're doing, how you're doing what you're doing. And better than that, here's the cool thing. He knows the motive of your heart. He knows why you're doing what you're doing. He knows what compels you into doing what you're doing. And if it's not centered in love, it's not centered in God. Amen? Sixth thing, bitterness and evil intent should not be a part of a Christian's life. Paying people back, evil for evil, seeking revenge on, on people for what they've done. Now here's the deal. The, the book of Romans, what does it say? In Romans 12 it says, don't, don't, leave, don't do that because you've got to leave room for God's wrath, right? That person will get in due time, right? What's Galatians 6 say? It says, um, You'll sow what you, you'll, you'll reap and you'll sow, right? With a person, God cannot be mocked. Don't be deceived. God can't be mocked. What a person sows, he too shall reap. It's coming around, full circle, for everybody. And for the follower, when you in, when you in get engulfed with that, oh, I'm going to get them back, what you've done in a nutshell is you said, okay, God, now you're going to get me back. <coughs> kind of a two-edged thing. And the last thing they said is it says, be forgiven. But I put this as our takeaway of our message today. Think about this. Rules never changed anybody. Only Jesus has. I, I love how Paul does this. I love how he strings this text together. Because he could have jumped right out of the gate and he said, You idiots live like this because you're all messed up. He didn't do that. He didn't say, Oh, by the way, you need to do this, do that. That's what religion does, right? Doesn't religion say you need to do this, 
you need to do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. And all of a sudden, we, all of a sudden we have these holy boundaries that we can do some things and we can't do some things. Guess what? The Holy Spirit was given to each person to guide them and convict them on an individual basis. Some things that you're going to think are lawful aren't going to be lawful in my life. Some things that I do, like, like for instance, one of the things that my wife and I, we don't drink it. It's not that, not that I can say you're messed up if you drink or beer's wrong or anything like that. It doesn't, even, it doesn't say that in the Bible. Sometimes we get way over the top and we start putting rules on everybody else's life. Here's why I don't drink. I had a problem drinking. I couldn't just drink one and I was fine. I drank one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and then I, I still wasn't fine. It was a stumbling block to me in my life. And also, I think as a representative of Christ, as a person in Christ, I think that somebody could look at my life, right? What's the one thing that God doesn't want to be is a stumbling block to others. Luke 17 says that if you cause a person to stumble, it would be better if you had a millstone fast around your neck. If somebody looks at my life, if the outsider's looking at me, kind of like my wife looking at their crib and can say, his crossbar is backwards. This ain't right. Something he's doing is not adding up. Then I need to recheck myself, right? I need to say, God, what do I need to change? What's got to go here? And for me, the, the reason why I don't do a lot of things I don't do, it's not because I think, oh, that's wrong or that is bad. I think that it doesn't give the right example to others if they look at my life. And so then he, all of a sudden he, he says all these things. And he says these things. You need to do this. You need to do this. This new Christian life. Here's some instructions for living. But before he says that, I want to go back to the 21st. He says, that's no life for you. It's almost like he's like, God wants better for you. God, does everybody believe that for their life? God wants what's best for my life. He doesn't want me to have an okay life. I think the coolest thing in, in Christianity, period, is that no matter how you came here today, you have the right to leave a different person because of what Christ did on the cross. You have the right every day to be a different person, to be a new creature. The Bible says it. It says that in Christ we're a new creature, right? And so he says, but this is why. He says, that's no life for you because you learned Christ. What does that mean? I learned Christ. I, I, I have a better life. There's something more out there for me because I learned Christ. Well, 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 14, starting, it says, Our firm decision is work from this focus center. So every Christian in here has the same focus center. What's the same? Okay? 2 Corinthians 5, 14, message translation, because I'm gangster. Okay? <laughs> one man died for everyone. How awesome is that? Just one man died for everyone. I don't know how many other people can do that. My life, I mean, how many people, it would, would news really spread about you that you died for everyone if you died today? No. That cross is the greatest scandal of all time that one person could go to a cross and that everybody everywhere could be eternally right with God by making one simple decision. That is cool. Right? And this is what he says. He says, this is the central focus of your faith if you believe in God. Christ died for everyone. Even the people you don't like. That puts everyone in the same boat, it says. What? We're all in the same boat in here? You mean God wants this unity thing and this team thing and he's serious about it? Oh yeah, he's serious about it. Matter of fact, this writer of this book, Paul, you know that the thorn in the side we talk about this all the time? The one thing could not live with was the danger that he did to the Christian faith. Can you imagine how he felt being a murderer of Christians and being a hater of, of, of what's going on in Christ's finished work on the cross? Can you imagine when he found Christ, how he felt about the way that he had lived before? He had some uber guilt in him. Guaranteed. But the cool thing is, is when you come in here and when you leave, you can make one decision to be a different person the rest of your life. And he says, he included everyone in his death so that everyone could, be, could also be included in his life. A resurrection life, a far better life than people ever live on their own. How true is that? Has anybody found that in Christ? There is forgiveness that you don't get in the world. 
In Christ there is a love that you can't find in the world. An unconditional, unfailing, never ceasing love. That regardless of what I do, what I've done, what I'm going to do. That His blood covers all my sin. Is that not kind of exciting? I mean that is awesome. That one man on Calvary. He went to the cross and he's like, hey guess what? I'm gonna die for you all. All you gotta do is accept me. All you gotta do is walk with me. Lean into me. Accept my love. Accept my forgiveness. But too often at times we live this mistaken identity in the past. And Paul reminds us, he says, the old has to go. It's got to go. There's nothing good in it. There's nothing good in that way of life. There's nothing right about what you're doing there. If it's not rooted in Christ, if the motive isn't for the building of the kingdom, if the motive isn't for loving your neighbor, loving God, then just be done with it. It goes on here in 2 Corinthians 5, 16. It says, because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. How many times are we guilty of that? How many times are we as followers of Christ looking at somebody and judging them? Looking at their situation and saying, well, they can't be right with God. And that person did this to me. And this person did that. Guess what the cool thing is? All that person has to do is repent. They're a new person. You don't even know them anymore. We look at the Messiah, Christ, that way we once and got it all wrong, as you know. You remember that? You remember how people were looking at Jesus and they were saying he's a sinner? He's a liar. He's a friend of tax collectors. He's wrong. He's messed up. He's extorting. He's doing all these other things wrong. And they were judging God in the flesh. And I talked about this a little bit last week. If God and Jesus went through the persecution, guess what, followers? We're going to get persecuted too. You've got to lovingly be able to respect people when that nature does. Hard to do. Hard to do. But the good news is, as a follower of Christ, you know that he went through it too. And you know that if he went through it, what does the Bible say? That if that power lives in us, greater is he who lived in the world because he overcame it. He overcame everything this world threw at him. And as a follower, you know how this ends. You know where you're going. It's this stupid stuff. That gets in our way weekly. It says, now we look inside. And what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start and is created new. Does that sound good to anybody else? How many fresh starts do we get? With people? Not many. How many fresh starts do we get in the workplace? Not many. I think it's usually called termination. How many fresh starts do we get in relationships? Once you kind of wrong somebody, they're usually done with you, right? This book is about the pursuing love of our Savior. This is one big book about God pursuing man, redeeming man, and bringing that man back to him, right? I did two weddings yesterday. And I, I did one in here, and then I did one outside in the middle of a thunderstorm. That was weird. And... One of the things that, that I think about is, is I think when they leave, you know, one of the things is that all of a sudden they have this new identity, right? You put this ring on and you wear that ring and it's a sign throughout your work week. It's a sign in life when you wear that. That symbolizes, I'm committed. I, I'm in. In this book, if this book is true, it means that you have to be a new creation. There has to be a new identity. There has to be a defining moment that when you get baptized, when you come out of the water, now you're actually wearing Christ as a symbol that you have changed. The Bible talks about the tree bearing fruit. It says that, that God's looking at our lives, right? And he's saying, what are you doing for me? Well, what are you doing right now? Are you loving your neighbor? Are you reaching people? Are you effectively communicating the gospel? Do people in your life know that you love the Lord? Do people in your life know, hey, guess what? I don't care what you've done. I accept you. I love you. Sure, you won't. It. Sure, you made it now. But guess what? I forgive you. I love you. That's what God is. That's what God does for us. The old life is gone. A new life begins. Look at it. All this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and Him. And then called us to settle our relationships with each other. Hmm. First ministry we're given. First ministry every Christian's given. Reconciliation. To be made right with others because God made us right with Him. Do you know what that means? If, if that's true... If you're reconciled to God, do you know how that fruit is buried in your life? Do you know how God looks at your life? 
Are you striving to forgive others? Anybody here got any animosity towards people? You know, in Matthew 5, when Jesus was talking about murder, he said, you, you heard what it said, Pharisees, don't commit murder. Well, guess what? Murder happens in your heart. It's when you're mad at people. It's when you stay mad at people. It's when you have a vendetta against people. That's murder. And if you do that, this is what he said. Didn't he? he said, don't even bother coming to the temple with your offering and going before God. Before you do that, you need to make it right with those people. And he's calling these hypocrites out. He's calling them hypocrites. He's calling them Guess what? Here's the cool news. It doesn't matter what anybody's done because your life isn't about you and so-and-so. It's about you and God. Is that not good news? As a Christian person and a follower of Christ, you look one place for approval. The cross. What other relationship has bore all my sin? What other relationship died for me? What, what other relationship took all that stupid thing that five years, I mean five years I was following Christ and I was living like maybe two-thirds of the way of a Christian life and he was still loving me. He, he was still calling me. He was still working on me. He was still, there, there's that sweet Holy Spirit conviction, you know, where he's like, I need to change this. I need to change this. You really got to work on this. And I just think when I look at that cross, when I think about our relationship that we have with God, it is so cool because it doesn't matter who you were yesterday, this morning, or right now, you can change. We can all change. It's that decision to walk intimately, hand in hand with the Holy Spirit. He says, God put the world square with himself through Christ, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sin. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. We all have a task. Everybody in here has a responsibility. If you've raised your hand, if you truly accepted Jesus Christ, we all have one task. To spread the love of Christ. That's it. He, he doesn't say, go, go dig a new well, go, go dig a ditch, go build a five by seven tent. He doesn't say any of that. He says, go be a representative of Christ. In your world. What's that great commission, right? The first thing Jesus said when he pops back, he says, guess what? I'm making you all my disciples, and your job is what? To go out and preach and reach the world. To go out and show the love of God. To go out and show the forgiveness. I don't care where you've been. I don't care who you've been. We love you here. It doesn't matter. I mean, I bet that's my favorite part about this church is that it really doesn't matter where you've been or who you are. We will love you and we will accept you right when you come to the and that is cool. God has given us a task telling everyone what he's doing. We're Christ representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making and friends. What difference is in your life? What's God stirring up in your heart to go back right? What things are bothering you? What things are troubling you? What things do you need to kind of fix or work on? <coughs> Because if God has reconciled to us, reconciled us to Him through Christ, then we need to be reconciled to one another. We're speaking for Christ Himself now. Become friends with God, He's already a friend with you. That is so huge. <coughs> to be a friend with God. To actually earnestly seek daily God's voice, God's wisdom, God's provision. To honestly, what is God saying to you right now? It's one of my favorite questions when I talk about God with people. What's he saying to you right now? Because if God lives in you, if God resides in you, then God is stirring something up in your heart right now. What is it? What does God want you to do for the kingdom? What is your gift? What is your calling? What is your talent? What are you supposed to do to benefit the gospel, to benefit the church, to benefit God? What is that thing in your life that you have to do to make that transition, to cut the old off, and just live the new life? Stop worrying about yesterday. Stop worrying about all your failures. I was talking to a guy recently, and he was telling me a story about how he hears, still hears his, his English teacher in the back of his head telling him how big of a failure he was. And I'm just like, I wonder how many people in the congregation all over the United States live on the past. Can't get over spilt milk. Can't get over what happened to them when they're 18, 22, whatever, whatever happened in your past. It's done. It's over with. Let's move on. Let's move forward. Let's stretch toward the kingdom. Verse 21. How you ask. In Christ, God puts the wrong on him who never did anything wrong. So we could be right with God. 
Some translation says that he became sin that knew, knew no sin so we could become the righteous. That's how you learn Christ. What did he do? Who was he? What did he do in the parables? How did he respond to people? When people came to Jesus and they tried trapping him, they tried tricking him, they tried asking questions, well, what do you say about giving money to the taxes? What do you say about divorce? What do you say about all these things? And how did Jesus respond to him? With Scripture. With what God wanted. Not with what religion wanted. I'm telling you, if you follow rules, if you think that you're just going to come in and automatically be holy, it's not happening. But if you follow the Holy Spirit and you have a desire to please God, to seek God, to hear His voice, to be a friend of God, then that change will start occurring. Because as you start hearing the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and as you start walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden you'll see, I can change. I'm not perfect, but I'm way better than what I used to be. And I'm making steps forward every day. It's pretty cool when you can look at your life and you can say, Man, I used to work fraud to handle about that thing. That, that used to drive me nuts when people did that. And now, I can love those people. So the new identity. Three things in a nutshell to the new identity. Number one, the old has to go. Everything from the past has to go. You have to make a decision today if you've never made that decision before in life. You have to make that decision at some point in your life to bury the past and be done with it, to move on from it. Paul makes this common Corinthians. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. That's a good rule to live by. I mean, you know, there would be times like early in marriage, like eight, nine months ago, we'd be walking through Walmart, and I'd say something stupid to my wife. She said, I didn't even know that about your past life. I'm like, oh, sorry. Who cares? You're the only person that builds up the past more than what it ought to be. It's done. It's over with. You can't go back and change it. You can't do anything about it. You might as well embrace loving God that God has to offer and move forward. Amen? And then the second thing, you have to trust that the renewing is happening. You have to trust God. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What? Daily in Christ. You know what that tells me? That tells me that one day without Christ renewing my mind makes me a bonehead. That, that tells me that, that if I go off on my own and I start thinking, I mean, what does that say? That old way? Hey, what's one thing that we all do as humans? We got a crazy thought life. Anybody else with me on that? I remember a year and a half ago, two years ago, when I laid down at night and it was just like an episode of the Twilight Zone went off my head. And I'm just remembering everything when I was five, when I was six, when I was seven. Couldn't ever sleep. And then all of a sudden, I found out what peace was. You know what the definition of biblical peace is? It's a calm assurance in knowing that what God is doing is best, even when it doesn't seem right. You have to trust God that He's making the decisions on your behalf as you walk with Him, as you do the things that He's asked you to do, that He will take care and provide for you, not just today, tomorrow, and the rest of your life. Because the past is gone. The renewing is happening. And then the third thing, live your God-given identity. You're a different person. You're not Saul anymore. Now you're Paul. You, you don't have to be that person that everybody says you are. You don't have to be that person your English teacher said you are. You don't have to be that past sin that keeps coming up to redefine you. You don't have to be that past broken relationship, that marriage that was supposed to be until death was part, but it really wasn't. That old thing that happened in your life that you can't get over. Guess what? It's not there no more. But guess what it is? That cross that died on Calvary. That man who went to that cross. He said, guess what? Here you go, Steve. I'm not just going to take one of your sins. I'm going to take all of them because I love you. And I want you to be right with God. And I'm going to ask you guys this question. What is your new life What is it that God wants you to be? Who is it that God wants you to be? I mean, what skills, what gifts has He given you? You remember that there's a parable in Matthew that talks about the one evil one that buried everything that He was doing? He, God had given Him all these gifts, all these talents, and He buried them, right? And that didn't make God very happy. Why? Because God has given each of us gifts, and it's our job to use them. There's not one person in this room that should feel worthless. 
There's not one person in this room that shouldn't feel equipped to do God's work. And Peter, Peter writes and he says, God's given us everything that we need to live a holy life. He's given us all the skills. You read 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4. You read it with go home. It says that God's given us all that we need to live a godly life, to live a holy life, to live a righteous life. And guess where you find it? It's found in here, not everywhere else that we look for. <clears throat> Until you dig into the relationship, the rules mean nothing. Rules aren't going to change you. They're just going to be a set of things that you continually define. You don't know why. It says to stop. I just can't stop. There's something in me. There's something greater in me. The sin in me controls me. And it, it, I can't do it. Guess what? Can I tell you a, a little secret of Christian life? We all need Jesus. And we're not ashamed to admit it. The one thing that everybody has in common here, like Paul said in Corinthians there, we're in the same boat. Everybody in here is in the same exact boat. And without the love of God, without Jesus Christ, without the forgiveness of our sins, and without knowing that that man died for our sins, we are a lost mess because we live in condemnation. We live in guilt. We live in that old lifestyle. We let those thoughts dominate us. We let those fears dominate us. And, and that's got to go. And I want us all to make a decision today. Why not live in your identity? Why would we go back to the same old, same old? Whatever your thing is that you're caught up on, whatever somebody's thing that they're caught up in, why would we let that old stuff define today, tomorrow, the rest of our life? Why not just bury it, burn it, and leave it at the cross? And let God take it and live the new identity that He's called us to do. One of the ways that we, uh, we get back to remembering what Christ has done for us is communion. If the worship team wants to come up. I've been instructed not to tell you guys anymore that I want to feel holy from the worship team, so I'm, but I'm going to feel holy in it. It's just who you but uh, communion is a time, the Bible says, that we remember what Christ did for us. And so what I want us to do is I want us to really look at our lives. Take a deep, deep look. Psalm 123 and 24. Search me, O God. Know my ways. Know my life. You know everything. You see my life. You see my future. You see ten steps ahead of what I see. You see right around that God. And you love me and you want what's best for me. Show me. Show me in my life what you want me to be. Show me what you want me to do. Show me who I'm supposed to be and give me the grace. Give me the strength to do it. Right? Colossians says if we receive the Lord, so we should walk in Him. That new identity, just like marriage. Just like putting on that ring every day. That, that commitment that we have to our spouse. That same commitment resides in the heart of every believer because when you accept Christ, you're to put Christ on. He's supposed to be your guidance, your wisdom, your provision. And so what we do when we commune is we, we drink the, the blood of Christ, which is we, we just do symbols. These are symbols. We don't actually believe that they actually become or anything like that. I mean, I know that there's different religions that believe different things. We actually use this as just a remembrance time to reflect on what God did for us, what Jesus did for us. And he says in the scripture, he says, when you guys do this, do it in remembrance of me. And so he was with the disciples, and he was in his last, last moments, as we all know, and he had his betrayer here, right? He had Judas there with him, and he had Peter, who was going to deny him. He had his group of closest people around the table, lounged out. One guy who's going to leave him to death, and one guy who's not going to say he's there, but he's really, how many people can identify with that today? You have people in your life who you thought were going to be there, but they really aren't there, right? You kind of feel Jesus on this one, right? He's like, hey, by the way, I'm going to to die. And he's probably thinking, you're going to betray me, you're going to deny me, and actually he says it, right? <laughs> How cool is that? To know that Jesus didn't give up on those people. I mean, if he didn't give up on a guy that denied him three times, he surely ain't done with us. Amen? He actually reinstates the man that denies him publicly times, which tells me, no matter how far you've gone out in this room, guess what? God's got forgiveness for you. God's got mercy for you. God's got compassion for you. And so he's lounging out with all his boys. He said, guess what, guys? I'm going to die. I'm going. i got to go. But guess what? I want you guys, every time you get together to celebrate communion, what I want you to do when you eat that bread, 
is I want you to remember. Now really, think about this. When we're talking, think about this. I want you to remember that my body was broken for you. I want you to literally remember that on that cross, when I was getting beaten, when I was getting taught, and when I was getting slapped, kicked around, and punished, I did it for you. Personally, you, you, you. Whoever you are in this room, I did it for you. He doesn't think you're worthless. He, he doesn't think that you, you're defined by your past. As a matter of fact, he thinks that you're so awesome and so valuable that he gave his life for you. And so when you guys do this, remember that my body was broken. And when you eat that bread, that's a sign that you've accepted my broken body in your life. And then regardless of where you're at, I want to heal you. I, I want to walk with you. I want to guide you. I want to be in your life. And I want to connect with you. And then he said, and when you drink, remember that that's my blood. The blood that was shed for the forgiveness of all your sins. How many sins? Not one, not two. All of them. There is no reason why anybody should leave here today and heal from any sin that they've committed. It's been paid for. The debt's paid, the ransom's paid. I was reading Leviticus this past week, and I'm doing a study for my school, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh. Can you, like, I'm thinking, I'm looking around Ward County, I'm thinking a few families would be so mad because they wouldn't have any livestock in the fair because I've been killing their cows trying to get around with God. They used to have to drag cows in front of the temple in front of everybody and slaughter them things and be made right as a sacrifice to get right with God. Cool thing. Jesus died. You don't have to. Cool thing. The Warren County Fair can still go on this week because Jesus Christ died on the cross. I bet they ain't going to give him a shout out though. I mean, how awesome is that? The, the Old Testament theme, the fleeting theme, right? Nobody could be right with God. Everybody tried to do it. It took one man. It took one perfect Savior. It took one fully flesh, fully God, individual, made God, made flesh. He walked on the earth. He roamed with the sinners. He had people cussing him, lied to him, treated him bad. And what did he do? He died for him. Closing words, Jesus, right, Father? No matter what you've done before we do communion, He's paid it. It's done. Everything in your life is done. The past is gone. The future is ahead. He's walking with you right now. He wants to lead you right now. Better than that, better than all, He's got a life for you that you couldn't even dream of. He's got an intimacy in Him to connect with you by the power of the Holy Spirit that is. It's mind-blowing. The power of God, the rest of the heart of the believer can surpass anything that this life throws up. you guys believe that? John 16, 33. Take heart. I will overcome this world. Let's pray. Let's take some time as a family before you guys come up and do communion to reflect exactly what it was that Jesus did for us. Father, we love you. If we read this Bible and we got a whole bunch of rules out of it, not a relationship, we fail. If we try to cast rules and judgment upon others without casting that relationship and that love with them, we fail. This book's a relationship. This book is love. This life is love. God, what you did on that cross, Jesus, when you bore that cross on Calvary, it showed us that you love us, God. In the craziest scandal of all time, whomever should believe in the name of Jesus Christ would not die but would have eternal life. Father, draw near to the troubled hearts in this room. Show them joy, show them love, show them peace that passes all understanding. And Lord, we make a decision to bury yesterday bury the past, to bury all of our failures, and embrace the love, Jesus, that only you could offer. And as we commune, and as we take on your body, as we take on your blood, we make a fresh commitment to walk in love, to walk in truth with one another, to help one another, to be givers, God. I pray that every person in here would commit to this building fund, that we commit to help building this church, we commit to their time, their talents, and their energies to build the kingdom. Most importantly, God, 
that we commit to knowing you love us, not circumstantially, but unconditionally. So, Lord, as we commune, we remember everything, Jesus, that you've done for us. All of our sins are forgiven, and all we have to do is accept that name of Jesus Christ and believe our sins have been paid for. We are redeemed, we are right, and we are new with you, and we will walk out of this place, Father, transformed by the renewing of our mind, by the renewing of our spirit. Jesus, thank you, we love you, and as we give our offering, we give our first and our best to you, it shows, God, that we love you, and we want to worship you. That's the way we worship you, Father. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this communion service. Bless it, in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can take some time and pray with your family as you guys feel the spirit leading.